Tonight's Bible reading will come from Psalm chapter 20. Starting at verse 1. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant you all your requests. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. This is the word of God. Oops, my mark is fading. I can barely see where I'm supposed to stand for the camera. Never mind. Now, we will get back to James next week. Um, I've done a lot of psalms in the morning, but I haven't done a lot in the evening. I was looking through what I've preached at this church over the last 14 and a half years, and there's not been a lot done on the psalms in the evening. So I thought uh, we could do a few psalms in the evening just to do... Uh, something a little different during holidays. Um, so let's pray and ask for God's help. Lord Jesus, we recognize our dependence upon you. Your word so aptly declares, without me you can do nothing. And while sometimes we think we do exist without you or we can do things without you we want to acknowledge this evening that everything we do depends upon your grace and even as we spend time in your word this evening we are reminded as Paul writes to the Corinthians under the inspiration of your spirit that spiritual things are spiritually discerned and for us to understand your word it requires your spirit to open our eyes And so we want to bring ourselves into submission to him and ask that you would speak to us through your word, by your spirit, for your glory. Amen. James Gilmore, a missionary to Mongolia, um, was once asked to treat some wounded soldiers. Although he was not a doctor, he did have some knowledge of first aid, so he felt he could not refuse the request. He dressed the wounds of the two men, but a third had a badly broken thigh bone. The missionary had no idea what to do for such an injury. Kneeling beside the man, he asked the Lord for help. He didn't know how God would answer his prayers but he was confident that his need would be supplied. He couldn't find any books on physiology in the primitive hospital, and no doctor arrived. To complicate matters, a crowd of beggars came to ask him for money. He was deeply concerned about his patient, yet his heart went out to those ragged paupers. Hurriedly, he gave them a small gift, plus a few kind words of spiritual admonition. A moment later, he stared in amazement at one weary beggar who had remained behind. The half-starved fellow was a little more than a living skeleton. The missionary suddenly realized that the Lord had brought him a walking lesson in anatomy. He asked the elderly man if he might examine him, and after carefully tracing the femur bone with his fingers to learn how to treat the soldier's broken leg, he returned to the patient and was able to set the fracture. 
Years afterwards, Gilmore often related how God had provided him with a strange yet sufficient response to his earnest prayer. When you and I raise our petitions to God, we can be certain that God will help us. And even if the answer comes in a strange and unusual way. This is what the psalm is about. It's about a, a situation that Israel finds itself in, and the nation is under severe distress. The king is under distress. And there is a battle looming that he's going to have to enter into. But as you can see from the psalm, he's not confident of how this battle is going to work out and, and how he's going to prevail over the enemy. And when we understand that the king stands on behalf of the nation, this doesn't just affect the king, this affects the entire nation. And so in this incredibly distressing time, together with the people, the king turns to the Lord and he prays. And it's a reminder for us that when we face distress, and let me tell you, for you younger people, if you live long enough, you're going to face distress. It's only a matter of time. And the very nature of distress sometimes can be severe and sometimes can be less severe. But the reality is we live in this broken world and we are not immune from the brokenness that we see around us. And you and I are going to experience distressing times. I've sat with people going through divorces. I've sat with people dying from cancer. I've sat with people whose babies were born and then died half an hour after they were born. I've sat with people who have lost 18-year-olds. I've sat with people who've been diagnosed with cancer or who have lost jobs, suffering from unemployment. I've seen the whole gambit of life. And so in those kinds of times, what do you do and what do I do as a Christian? Where do we turn? Because there's so many solutions out there that the world would advocate. And yet Scripture brings a totally different view on what we are to do and how we are to respond in distressing times. Firstly, I want you to notice that we are to request help from God. Look at verses 1 to 4. It sounds obvious, but often it's not. Often going to God is the last port of call. Verse 1 to 4. May Yahweh answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Now, it's interesting that he uses the God of Jacob. Now, you will know that sometimes the nation of Israel was split into the northern and southern nation. The north, which was generally referred to Israel, and the south that sometimes was referred to as Jacob. But the reason that he uses Jacob here is because it is a reminder of the redeeming nature of Yahweh. Let me read to you and take you back to Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. Just to show, I'm not making this up. Then Moses went up to God, and Yahweh caught him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. In other words, it's taking us back to when Moses was on the mountain before the Lord, and when the Lord was speaking to him and speaking about how he had redeemed the nation from Egypt, how he had protected them, how he had taken them out. And it's a reminder to the people that this God to whom they are turning and whom they are bringing their request is more than capable of redeeming them. Sometimes I think you and I doubt that. Sometimes I think intellectually we give assent to that. We go to God in prayer about a particular problem. And somewhere in the recesses of our minds, we kind of believe that God's going to answer, but we're not really sure about it. And so we pray in a kind of half-believing and half-disbelieving sense. And what the psalmist is trying to encourage us to remember is that when we turn to God in times of distressing, that He is more than capable, more than able of redeeming us in spite of perhaps our lack of understanding. But it's also a reminder to the nation, not only to the entire nation of how God redeemed them out of Egypt, but it's a reminder to the nation of how God intervened in the life of Jacob. 
So, for example, Genesis 32, verses 6 and 7. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you with 400 men are with him. In great distress and fear, uh, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and herds as cam camels as well. Genesis 35, 3. Then he came and said, us, let us go to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress. So Genesis 35 takes us back to the distress that he experienced with the approach of Esau and his 400 men and reminds us that God delivered him in the day of his distress and who has been with me wherever I go. So here is a man who understood that in distressing times, God was more than capable of delivering him. And what's interesting when we think of the deliverance of Jacob and we read of the king crying out to God, we discover also it reminds us and points us forward to another one who in distressing times cried out to God. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember the distress that overwhelmed his soul. Remember the cry up to God to deliver him if it were part of his will. Or remember the prayer of Jesus on the cross. Remember as he was on that cross and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So even in the times of the greatest pressure that Jesus is under, we, 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 we discover the Savior crying out to God. Let me ask you, if Jesus cries out to God, how much more should you and I in distressful times cry out to God? Notice what else he says. May he send you help from the sanctuary. What is the reason he includes that in there? What does the sanctuary symbolize? It symbolizes the presence of God. So it's a way of saying, may he send you his presence. May he support you from Zion. May he go before you. May he be with you. May you experience that definite sense of God's help in terms of his presence with you, symbolized by the sanctuary. Notice what else he says. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. Now, this is also an interesting way in which he frames that. One of the things that the Israelites did frequently was bring offerings to God. But we must remember that sacrifices to be acceptable to God had to arise out of a heart that was in touch with God and wasn't out of step with God. Sometimes he would reject those sacrifices. And simply by offering a sacrifice didn't always guarantee God's favor. So, for example, in 1 Samuel 13 verses 9 to 12. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished speaking, making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and where, th th that you did not come at the set time and the Philistines were assembled at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come up against me at Gigal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer a burnt offering. And that was rejected by God. In other words, when we come before the Lord in prayer, and when we seek out God's help in those times, we should always come with a heart that has cleansed itself. A heart that has recognized that there are times where before we enter into praying, we need to ask that God would cleanse us and purify us. So that we do come before him with a heart that is pure from sin. And when we do, we know that as an act of devotion, God accepts those sacrifices as happens here. May he give you the desire of your heart. Now let's just pause there because it's very easy for us to kind of narrow that down and say, well, the desire of my heart is to 
earn a Ferrari and drive a Ferrari around. And, you know, the Lord says, grant you the desires of, oh, that's the desire of my heart. But notice what comes prior to that. What comes prior? The sacrifices, right? So in other words, it is a heart that is conformed in devotion to God. And the desires that are arising out of the heart are rising out of devotion to God. So that the desires, therefore, are in conformity to the will of God. And so when he says, may the desires of your heart be answered, he can say that with confidence because the desires that are coming from the heart are desires that God has placed there because the person has made sure that they're in the right place as they bring those desires to God. And it's so important, isn't it, that we ensure that the heart is in the right place. May he <clears throat> make all your plans succeed. A heart that is committed to God a heart that lives in submission to God, a heart that is devoted to God, a heart that seeks God's priorities above all else, can pray with confidence that whatever it plans will succeed. Because those who are close to God and those who do things out of a relationship with God do things in accordance with the will of God because their will is being shaped by God. And so the plans that they make are plans according to God's will. And therefore, they can have confidence in praying to God and seeking for those plans to be successful. And so he prays and asks God from a heart that is right before God, that God would intervene in this situation. Help the king. He needs to go out into battle. Let him succeed in battle. Let him win the battle. Those desires to seek your glory because victory of the king is not about the king getting victory. It's about God ruling through the king and God being glorified in his victory. It's such a pity that so often for us we can so easily turn to coping mechanisms that are not necessarily grounded in scripture. And yet here we are encouraged to turn our face towards God, to make sure that we pray with a heart that is submitted to God so that when we pray, we can be confident of answers. Whatever your distress that is maybe lying ahead, unless you're going through it right now, it may relate to employment. It may relate to a relationship. It may relate to health. It may relate to work. It may relate to studying. I don't know, but you can come before God and seek his help. Secondly, prayer, or what do we do in expressing time? We express praise to God. Look at verse 5. We will shout for joy when you are victorious. Now, isn't that interesting? The assumption, we'll come back to this, the assumption here is when we are victorious, not when we may be victorious, when we are victorious. There's a definiteness to that. And we'll lift up your banners in the name of our God. May the Yahweh grant all your crests. In other words, such is the confidence of the psalmist as he turns towards God in prayer and the king that before victory has even been won on the battlefield, they can lift their hearts in praise to God, knowing that God is going to answer their prayer. And so the whole emphasis there, banners were a way in which they could wave the banner of victory over the enemy. It was part of the military uh, tradition. And they are taking joy that, that God is going to grant victory to the king, that victory is assured by the king. And so they respond with great joy as a result of that. And they praise God, and they give thanks to God, and they rejoice because of the confidence they have in the victory that God has assured. Now, can I say to you in a very careful way that when you pray, the victory in your prayers is not dependent upon your faith, but is dependent upon the finished work of Christ on the cross. 
So you can be absolutely assured without any shadow of a doubt that every prayer you ever utter will be fully answered because of the cross of Jesus Christ. You see, our prayers are not dependent upon whether we have great or little faith. Sometimes we pray out of little faith and God answers. But our prayers are dependent upon what God has accomplished in Christ on the cross. And in the same way they raise their banner of victory, we can shout with praise and joy to God, knowing that before we even utter the prayer on our lips, God has already answered it in Christ. And that is a cause for great rejoicing. So that every prayer you and I pray is a result of God's incredible grace that is exercised towards us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, when you pray, is there a sense of rejoicing? Is there a sense of thankfulness? Is there a sense of joy? Do you look ahead with eager anticipation to how God will answer your prayer? And then thirdly, I want you to notice that you can rest confidently in God. Look at verses 6 to 9. Once you've prayed, rest confidently confidently in God, not in yourself, not in your abilities, not in your faith, but you rest in what God has already accomplished, even though you might not see it at a visible level in the here and the now. Look at verses 6 to 9. Now I know that Yahweh saves his anointed. He answers him from holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. So victory, as far as this psalmist is concerned, has already occurred, but the battle hasn't been fought. And the reason he's assured of victory is because he is confident that as they've submitted themselves and turned themselves to Yahweh, that Yahweh fights the battle on their behalf. Notice how he follows up. Some trust in chariots, some trust trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's a way of the psalmist saying, you have said to us, Lord, that in times of distress, when we are surrounded by our enemies, we should not rely on other nations. We should not turn to chariots. We should not look to horses. We should not look to our own strength. We should not trust in our own power, but we should submit to you and allow you to fight on our behalf. And that's what we're doing. And so he rests in that. He is secure in that. He is confident in that. He doesn't doubt what God is going to do. We are told in Deuteronomy 7, verse 16 and 17, um, the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord. It's talking about the law. He's got and follow carefully the words of this law and those decrees. In other words, the king is not successful because he has better military ability than other kings. He is successful because God wins the battle on his behalf. And when he says, now I know... Uh, now I know, verse 6, that the Lord saves. That's literally saying, I have come to the conclusion that victory is assured, being accomplished. The church and you and I as Christians, in other words, we rely on the strength that comes from God rather than looking to our own strength to accomplish that which God calls us to accomplish and that which God, uh, how God calls us to live. It's so easy when we are serving the Lord and so easy when we are living out our Christian ethics to think that somehow by greater effort on our own strength, we can accomplish that which only God can accomplish. And what you and I need to learn to do is submit ourselves totally to God, surrender every part of our being to God, and allow God through the power of the Holy Spirit to so descend upon us and so fill us and so have control of our being that everything we do arises out of the strength that he supplies. That's why Paul, when he prays to the Ephesians, says, I pray that God out of his glorious riches may strengthen you with power in the inner being 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And he uses two out of the three possible Greek words for power in those short verses, Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. And he prays that they may experience God's power so that as they go out and are thrust out into the world and they face the challenges they face, they can be assured that the way in which they operate and how they live and what they do is all fueled by God. And that's how you live a victorious Christian life. We are so often defeated as Christians because we try and do it ourselves. We think that somehow if we drum up enough strength, we can accomplish that which only God can accomplish. What does Jesus tell you? He says, you can do nothing without me, John 15. Nothing. And then he reminds us in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. So that we allow God to strengthen us in our praying, in our living, in our service. And because we rely on the strength of God, we can rest in confidence knowing that whatever it is we face, however great a challenge it is, whatever the hurdle is, God is able to help us to hurdle that particular obstacle. The name of God should never be forgotten. Christ is your strength. Notice what he goes on to say. We trust in the name of the Lord. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Let nothing, Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians in chapter 15, verse 58, says, let nothing move you. Stand firm in the work of the Lord. Paul, writing to the Ephesians in chapter 6, tells us to put on the armor of God. And when we have put on all the armor of God, stand firm in the strength of God. Oh, how can I implore with you and plead with you to realize that you can't accomplish things on your own, that you can't live your Christian life based upon your own efforts, that you are dependent upon the strength of God to enable you to do that. He is the ever-present, self-existing, immutable, I am, says uh, a God, Yahweh to Moses, who fills us. It is Paul who writes and says in Philippians 4, verse 16, uh, 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Or writing to the Corinthians in chapter 12, verse 9 and 2 Corinthians, when I'm weak, then he is strong. And so you and I rest in the confidence of the power of Almighty God. And God's power is unlimited. It's not restricted by our small faith. It's not restricted by our small view of God. It's not restricted by the way we sometimes box God. God is able to accomplish that which you and I think is impossible and is able to do miracles. If only you and I really believe that. Sometimes I think we know it, but we doubt it. When last did you pray for a miracle in your life? When last did you see God move in such a powerful way that you could only ascribe it to God and not to yourself? Let me close with a story. It's nice and short tonight. Don't get used to it. One night, this is talking about a, uh, this is not me, so this is a story I, I saw recently. One night, I'd worked hard, hard to help a mother in the labor ward, but in spite of this as another missionary, all we could do, she died, leaving us with a tiny, premature baby and a crying two-year-old daughter. We would have difficulty keeping the baby alive as we had no incubator. We had no electricity to run an incubator. We also had no a special feeding facilities. Although we lived on the equator, Nights were often chilly with treacherous drafts. One student midwife went for the box we had for such babies and the cotton wool and the baby would be wrapped in. Another went to stoke up the fire and fill a hot water bottle. She came back shortly in distress to tell me that in filling the bottle, it had burst. Rubber perishes easily in tropical climates. And in it, our last hot water bottle, she exclaimed. 
As in the West, it's no good crying over spilled milk. So in Central Africa, it might be considered no good crying over burst water bottles. They do not grow in trees. There are no drug stores down forest pathways. All right, I said. Put the baby as near to the fire as you can, safely can, and sleep between the baby and the door to keep it free from drafts. Your job is to keep the baby warm. The following noon, as I did most days, I went to have prayers with any of uh, the orphanage children who chose to gather with me. I gave the youngsters various suggestions of the things to pray about and told them about the tiny baby. I explained our problem about keeping the baby warm enough, mentioning the hot water bottle. The baby could so easily die if it got chills. I also told them that the two-year-old sister crying because her mother had died. During the prayer time, one 10-year-old girl, Ruth, prayed with the usual blunt conciseness of our African children. Please, God, she prayed, send us a water bottle. It'll be no good tomorrow, God, as the baby will be dead. So please send it this afternoon. Would you pray like that? Just think about that. Just pause for a minute. Have you ever prayed like that? Well, I gasped inwardly at the audacity of the prayer. She added by way of corollary. And while you're about it, would you please send a dolly for the little girl so she'll know you really love her? As often with children's prayers, I was put on the spot. Could I honestly say amen? I, did, I just did not believe that God could do this. Oh, yes, I know that he can do everything. The Bible says so. But there are limits. Aren't they? The only way God could answer this particular prayer would be by sending me a parcel from the homeland I'd been in Africa for almost four years at that time, and I'd never, ever received a parcel from home. Anyway, if anyone did send me a parcel, who would put it in a hot water bottle? I lived on the equator. Halfway through the afternoon while I was teaching in the nurses' training school, a message was sent that there was a car at my front door. By the time I reached home, the car had gone, but there on the veranda was a large 22-pound parcel. I felt tears prickling my eyes. I could not open the parcel alone, so I sent for the orphanage children. Together we pulled off the string, carefully undoing each knot. We folded the paper, taking care not to tear it unduly. Excitement was mounting. Some 30 or 40 pairs of eyes were focused on the large cardboard box. From the top, I lifted out brightly colored knitted jerseys. Eyes sparkled as I gave them out. Then there were knitted bandages for the leprosy patients, and the children looked a little bored. Then came a box of mixed raisins and sultanas that would make a batch of buns for the weekend. Then, as I put my hand in again, I felt... Could it really be? I grasped it and pulled it out. Yes, a brand new rubber hot water bottle. I cried. I'd not asked God to send it. I'd not truly believed that he could. Ruth was in the front row of the children. She rushed forward crying out, If God sent us the bottle, he must have sent the dolly too. Rummaging down to the bottom of the box, she pulled out the small, beautifully dressed dolly. Her eyes shone. She had never doubted. Looking up she, at me, she asked, can I go over with it and give this dolly to that little girl so she'll know that Jesus really loves her? The parcel had been on the way for five whole months. Packed by my former Sunday school class, whose leader had heard and obeyed God's prompting to send a hot water bottle even to the equator. And one of the girls had put in a dolly for an African child five months before the answer to believing prayer of a 10-year-old to bring it that afternoon. Do you believe in miracles? Do you believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe in a God answering God? Do you? Do you pray and doubt? Do you pray with confidence? 
Do you lay your request at the foot of the cross and say, okay, Lord, bring it on? Maybe we see so little movement in Christianity and in the church and in our own lives because we trust so little and we don't pray bigger prayers and we don't pray more, pray more trusting prayers and we don't look to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, you can do anything. I'm not just saying it. I actually believe it. When last did you pray for a miracle? When last did you trust God to intervene in a spectacular way that defies all logic? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this psalm that encourages us to pray. We confess that sometimes we doubt. We confess that sometimes we are weak and frail. We confess that sometimes our prayers are disbelieving prayers. We like that missionary. When we hear a prayer like that, we think God can't answer that. But help us to be by like that little 10-year-old girl who prayed so innocently, who prayed so confidently, who prayed so expectantly, and who rested in the confidence of a God who can do anything. Lord, I don't know where everyone is at this evening, but you do. I don't know what's on their minds. I don't know what distresses they may be experiencing. I don't know what things they may be looking for. I don't know what miracles that they may be seeking. But I pray that you would give them the courage to pray with absolute confidence, knowing that you, the God of all glory, will answer them. The answer has already been secured in Christ. Help them to rest in him. For Jesus' sake. Amen.